Hey, Steve. Hello, how are you doing? How are you, my man? Are you good? <laughs> we got uh, myself and Kieran Bracken from Rucket here, mate. Um, how you doing? Very nice, glad, nice, nice to see you. Very doing? glad you could join us, mate. Good very good. glad you could join us. No, it's such a pleasure, man. Good, I could. But yeah. you're, uh, mate, you're obviously a hard man to track down. Um, busy boy. What are you up to at the moment? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I'm up to a few things there, Minty. So I came back from the States uh, a few uh, months ago. And, um, yeah, just been stuck in, uh, in the lockdown with the family. And, uh, yeah, I decided to, you know, start studying. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a, a MBA course uh, with Henley Business School. And then I'm also involved in a security business, uh, which has been like a long-term thing for the last nine years. So now I'm uh, literally, like, getting fully involved and, uh yeah, you know, getting ready to transition there. Can I, can I ask you that, uh, I mean, it must be hard to the transition. I mean, I went, when I finished, I ended up doing Dancing and I, so maybe you should do that. I don't know whether I was Dancing with the Stars, but how are you finding it? I, I believe I read about that you find it quite hard, the mental fitness required to study. It's so different to looking after your body, isn't it? How's that been? Yeah, no, it's been quite a challenge. Uh, yeah, so I think... Uh, for myself, you know, I'm, I was very fortunate to kind of, you know, have uh, something on the side, you know, to focus on besides rugby. So I've always been involved in security. So I kind of used to be go to the office, you know, and uh, when I wasn't uh, training or playing. So it was kind of, you know, told me, you know, uh, quite early on. But uh, yeah, the studying part has been the, the toughest challenge, you know, sitting on eight hour lectures on Zoom and uh, yeah. to, uh, you know, getting all the information. But I guess, you know, it's growth, you know. Uh, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So <laughs> I'm just trying to get, you know, go with the floor, get into a bit of a routine and get more used to it. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm well, you put, mate, you put your body through the ringer for enough years. So it's now your mind you're giving a, a proper work over, isn't it? Um, yeah. Mate, so what? So regards to America, are you are you now done over there? Or are you waiting for the, um, the lockdown to finish? Because um, you're at DC, DC United, is that correct? Uh, no, it's Old Glory. Old Glory. In old DC. Glory, Old Glory. Yeah. Washington, D.C., though. Yeah, in D.C., yeah. No, it was a great adventure. Um, uh, it's just that uh, right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about whether uh, going back next season, I'm in talks with the, with the club. Uh, but, I, you know, I had, a, I had an awesome uh, stint for those two months. It was really going well. And I think the team was unbeaten. And, uh, you know, I was getting involved in a lot of... Uh, uh, CSI work, you know, in, around the DC area, working with kids. So there was a lot of exciting things, you know, off the field that I was doing. So yeah. it was just a pity that everything got cut short, you know. But I, I yeah, so. you've you've always been a big fan of America. I remember talking to you last year when you were, you know, you said that you know this would be your last year in South Africa for the Sharks and the Springboks, and we'll get on to that in a bit. But you've always been a big fan. They've treated you well, haven't you? You've always enjoyed it. Your family over there. Yes, yeah, I've always been a, a big fan of uh, the U.S. Uh, and I traveled there back and forth with my with my wife, uh, you know, on holidays. And I'm a huge NBA fan, so any chance I can get to go watch a game is like, yeah, you know, incredible. So I'd love to. I'd love to know. Were you ever tempted to come to Europe? Maybe, maybe where you know the pound sign is a bit stronger than the rest of the world. You fancy coming and playing in the cold uh, times in the UK? No, <laughs> too cold, mate. Too cold. <laughs> no, it's too cold, man. I'm, um, yeah, no, I'm not a big fan of the cold. Um, I guess you know that, you know the the the, the end of year tours we usually play you know, in Europe um, are always quite challenging for me because the weather is, uh, you know, is not ideal. But I, you know, there's so much to to see, so I enjoy the sightseeing. So I think I'd rather play in somewhere. <laughs> Why, <laughs> mate? You didn't seem to struggle whenever I came across you, boys. I have to say, we played. Um, you know, most of my career spent playing South Africa in the box. Was that ridiculously good side you had from 07 to sort of 2011, wasn't it? Before, obviously, last year. Um, anyway, mate, 117 caps, most caps South African Super Rugby player, Lions Test Series winner, World Cup winner. I'm not going to ask you what your favourite is. But you've got a few shirts in the background there. Just um, do, do, are they quite symbolic? Do they mean anything to you, or they just represent the teams you played for? Oh, uh, yeah, they are quite symbolic. Yeah, so this is like my my trophy room, and it's also my study 
So I pretty much uh, do most of my work in here. So I get to like you know uh, gaze on the you know on the um, on the trophies and the jerseys you know from time to time. Just go down memory lane. So I think I've got a few Sharks jerseys. Uh, that, you know when we played in the final, obviously we didn't win a Super Rugby, which is not ideal. But I've got like you know the most capped uh, uh, you know Super Rugby player ever. The, the jerseys we played against the Lions last year. Remember? Eh? Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, the white one. And then the other two is like, yeah, the World Cup final jersey. And then the other one is my 100th test, yeah. So, yeah, I've got a few. Mate, you, mate you better make sure your security co- your security company doubles doubles up the manpower <laughs> with that World Cup jersey. You don't want that going missing. <laughs> yeah, no, you have a, str- a strong entourage surrounding that whenever you take that away, mate. That's for sure. <laughs> Can I can I ask you about that final because myself and Nick were uh, we were actually doing Sky Sports and um, I think one of the key areas Nick uh, pointed out was in the front row that the that that actually you guys you you planned it all the way through that if you got to the final you could be sting in the scrum so what what was your take on it because obviously Carl Sinclair getting injured a lot of people think that may have affected it maybe England played their final against New Zealand semi final and you guys didn't play great against Wales uh, but then getting to the final but the front row seemed to have a big impact throughout that uh, throughout that final, didn't it? When you you actually brought players on as well to make a difference. So, what was your take on the front row battle? I think um, you know it was a combination of uh, all the hard work you know um, we put in probably over the last uh, you know two years uh, prior to the World Cup. I think you know we played a lot of focus on our set piece, and uh, it was mm-hmm. something that we, you know, with Mad Proudfoot, you know, um, obviously being the, the scrummaging coach, you know, he like really set standards, uh, you know, at training and really like you know set goals and that we need to use this as a weapon against uh, you know teams. And then uh, you know we started growing in that in that department and got better at it. You know, and the more focus we put on it, you know, the better we got. And then eventually, when he went, you know, when he got to the World Cup, we used it as a, you know, as a, as a, as a weapon to get, you know, uh, penalties, um, you know, uh, leading to that final. So it was, in a way, it was kind of uh, not um, not ideal for Carl Sinclair to kind of get injured. And I thought for the guy because, you know, I've, I'm a, I've got huge respect for Carl, and I think he's a, you know, he's an incredible rugby player, and he was probably the best, you know, uh, tight end at the World Cup. So uh, yeah, it was it was kind of, it kind of just you know worked in our favor that he you know he didn't end up playing. I think Dan Cole was probably not uh, uh, you know match fit, so he kind of you know got thrown into it, and uh, we just targeted him. And then uh, yeah, all the hard work you know we put in before that just paid off, and then we ended up getting four so penalties and getting some crucial points you know through the scrum. Yeah, it was a massive deciding factor. Um, look, but Beastie, obviously a tremendous career and everything, but certainly up here and amongst Englishmen, you are known for making mincemeat of our tight head props. Um, <laughs> two, two, two of the biggest games um, I think you can play are Lions Test Deciders and Lions Tests and World Cup Finals. And, you know, you've come to the fore and risen to the occasion in both of them. So I just want to take you back because clearly there's a Lions Tour next year in your home country now. Um, and everyone's looking forward to that. South Africa are world champions again, just like they were in 2009. But you were only a year, correct me, you made your debut 2008 against Wales, um, came on the autumn tour. You're a year into playing for South Africa. Clearly, your dream had been realised and recognised. But there's something different when the Lions come into town, isn't there? No, definitely. I think the hype, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of history of the Lions. And, uh, and I, I, um, I, I just remember hearing the older guys, you know, talk about it at the time when I was a youngster, saying that now, you know, we lost the li- last Lions tour and uh, we really want to make amends. And, uh, you know, this is like probably the next best thing to winning a World Cup. So, you know, it was just like surreal, you know, for me to be part of that team, you know, having... You know, the legends, Victor Madfield, Fareed Dupree, Bucky's boy, you know, just being, you know, having that, you know, them kind of rubbing shoulders with me and imparting so much knowledge, uh, you know, just kind of made, made me rise up to the occasion, you know. And, uh, yeah, I guess I saw it as an opportunity as well to, to um, you know, stamp my authority in the rugby world. You know, I was an unknown uh, in a way because I was still trying to find my, you know, find my feet at test match level, and uh, you know, get 
he's breaking now. So now I was going up, you know, against somebody like Hugh Vickery, you know, a guy who had all the accolades and had been captain of England, won the World Cup. So it was kind of my motivation that I want to prove a point. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, having the backing of the guys behind me, you know, just made the biggest difference. And I think the guys, the Lions guys didn't know what hit them in that first round. You know, nah, 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 nah. I, 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 remember it, I remember it well. It's, uh, it's etched in the memory, mate, unfortunately. Um, but to just take us back um, to the start, the start of your sort of journey into professional rugby in South Africa, because you were, you're born in Zimbabwe, um, you're in Zim, you know, for a long period of your, your early life, and then you, you came over to South Africa, um, and literally just your dream was to represent the Springboks. Is that correct? You know, that's why you sort of came over. You backed your ability. You're obviously. Very, very talented man as far as rugby is concerned. And uh, just tell us a little bit more about that. Back row player as well, I believe, at the start. Yeah. Well, he, well, he played the best position on the part, mate. Oh, shut he, up. He wasn't, shut he, up. Made, he wasn't gifted enough to carry it through. <laughs> I'll forgive you. No, no, no. Geez. The best... The best place to be is the front row. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, is that, mate, is that because you come off after 50 minutes now, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> you take a breather. No, man. So, yeah, just going way back, I think, um, I, you know, I, I got scouted. You know, I went to, I did all my schooling in Zim, and I, you know, I, was, a, you know, I was a number eight in my old school career. So, I got uh, scouted by the Sharks on a rugby tour. We played a couple of schools in Durban. And uh, yeah, you know, they offered me a bursary uh, to come and study, and, uh, you know, and then obviously it would look after me. Uh, so it was like a dream come true for me, you know, to, to come from Zim, where you, you can't pursue a profession, you know, profession in rugby. So I'd all, I was always wanting to come to South Africa. So I knew exactly where I was going. So I had to go back and finish my A levels, uh, and I did. And then I uh, eventually made the trip to Durban. And my dream, I can tell you from the onset, was just to play for the Sharks. You know, I just, I was like a, an avid fan of the Sharks. So it was like, I had to pinch myself you know, that I'm actually in Durban and uh, you know, I'm at the academy and on this, on this path. And uh, yeah, I just kind of, you know, um, took everything in. And uh, for me, it was do or die. You know? I had to like work my ass off because as a, you know, as a Zimbabwe kid, or, you know, coming into the setup, you, nobody knows you, so they, you know everybody just understand uh, underestimates your your ability. So I had to like you know um, prove my worth and earn my respect from the guys around me, and then you know eventually you know made my way, got obviously changed to the front row for me to be able to play for the Sharks, and then made my debut, and then I, I was just wanting to kind of you know um, solidify my position in the Sharks team for as long as possible, and uh, just before I knew it, you know. 2007, I made my debut with the Sharks, and then the Springboks came calling in 2008. And I wasn't even thinking about playing for the Springboks. It was still just, I want to, you know, do as best as I can and hopefully get noticed one day to, you know, to play for the national team. And then, yeah, it happened the following year, so it was pretty crazy. And regards, you know, who you played with in the front row, it's, it's important, isn't it, to keep that cohesion and sort of continuity is... You know, you had those legendary Sharks front rows, Yanni Duplessis, Bismarck Duplessis, and of course, John Schmidt. I'm going to ask you a question here, mate. At hooker, packing down against, okay, let's not say England in the World Cup final, but the England scrummaging pack now, right? Who have you got a hooker, John Schmidt or Bismarck Duplessis? Because, because during, during that period of dominance, because I remember because I was playing a lot then, during that period of dominance, the only sort of controversy that was always in and around selection and rugby, wasn't it, was about John Schmidt and whether he was, you know, should be captain at tight head or captain at hooker and whether he was the best hooker. So, are you going to be able to answer the question or are they two very, very good, good friends of yours and you're just literally going <laughs> to split it and sit on the fence there, beastie? No, no I, I think, you know, both of them are, are very uh, are special players and I think they... Yeah, I think they're, they're different kind of strength. So uh, it would be hard to uh, pick one. But I would say, you know, the thing is, I played with Bismarck for longer than John. So we got, like, you know, to know each other really well. And I think Bismarck was always a, a guy who kept me accountable. He was very hard on me. He always made sure that, you know, I didn't cut corners or I didn't just, you know, rest on my love. So I think Bismarck drove me to be the best that, you know, that I could be. So 
I think Bismarck definitely made the biggest difference in my career. Can yeah, I can I just right. can, can I just ask you? I mean, I I mine. I, you, you probably won't even know who I am. I, I played for England a long time ago, and my nickname was Kieran. My nickname, my nickname was Kieran Broken because I was always getting injured. All right, but <laughs> I, I just read a story and I saw an interview about your probably kind of recent injury, not too long ago, when you had heart heart problems, which is quite unusual in rugby. But but tell us about that. Was that quite, that must have been quite scary? Was it? No, it was scary, man. It was probably the, the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. And um, uh, it happened in 2010, the first time it happened. I was just um, uh, at a lunch with the boys, uh, the Sharks boys after training. And uh, yeah, we were just having some coffee and uh, eating. And then next thing I just felt my heart you know, uh, racing you know, out of sync. And then I immediately knew that something was, you know, was, was not right, you know, because I was sitting down, but I felt like my heart was, you know, was uh, pumping so fast, like I was running on the field. So I rushed up to the doctor and then they sent me to your cardio and uh, yeah, they, they had to do tests on me and he basically told me that I've got a heart to read me, you know, my heart. Uh, wow. Thing. So it's obviously the first time I picked it up. Uh, and then he told me that I had to, I probably was not going to be life threatening or, you know, or on my career, but I had to get it sorted out. So, you know, there was a lot of negativity around it when people found out the media, uh, you know, is this ever going to be the same again? You know, it's got heart <laughs> issues, you know, how it is, you know, and then it kind of just starts like, you know, uh, becoming even bigger than it is, you know, mm. because of the talk, you know. So I kind of, yeah, I just, you know, got, you know, my, my family and everybody closest to me, uh, you know, and those are the people I confided in. And they came you know, and they, alongside me and just, you know, uh, prayed with me and, uh, you know, um, gave me all the support I needed. And then I had to do this whole process called ablation in Cape Town where you, uh, yeah, because I, I, I played, I actually carried on playing, but I had to go for the process uh, in December in the off season. I went, uh, yeah, to go see this guy, this uh, guru who has done like a million of these ablations. Uh, they put you under and then they put a catheter through your groin all the way to your heart. Oh, my God. Because oh. uh, yeah, they say your heart works like an electric circuit and then they burn out those little You did say, Beast, you did say <laughs> groin, didn't you? Yeah, groin, yeah. They put it through your groin to your heart. Yeah. And, you mean, and, you mean, and you mean groin, do you? Yeah, I mean groin. <laughs> 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 oh, mate. So, Nick, what you won't notice, because, you, you know, because I'm uh, just... just I don't know whether you saw, but I did see um, the Beast's house. Now, you, you live in London and I live in North London, right? So we're, our house our, our house would fit in his uh, underground basement. What a house you've got. I mean, seriously. Is that uh, Beastie? Is that, is that still your place in uh, Salt Rock, Brettonwood? Yes, it is. Is it still the same place? Yeah, it is. Wow. Yeah. It's like okay, MTV that, that, that facility. Oh, wait. It belongs to my wife, it's not mine. <laughs> is she in the room with you, is she? No, she's not. <laughs> Beastie, mate. Right, so, your nickname. I think a lot of our listeners here and subscribers will want to know how you got it. You know, it's pretty obvious now, you know, from your feet on a field. and uh, But uh, the, the, what we, I know, you know the true story behind where you got your nickname from. But uh, I think, it's only fair that you enlighten our viewers <laughs> of how it came about. <laughs> no, I, I, hope, mate, I hope you're thinking of the same uh, story as I. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you're thinking about it differently because if you, get, it, don't, it depends on the source where you got. Uh, the <laughs> New Year, mate. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. You got. <laughs> you know exactly what's like. New Year's Eve. You got okay. back home a little early. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, okay, all right, okay, but Good that's man. probably part of the nickname. But I got that nickname when I was nine years old, like literally in primary school, and it was all it was because I was a I was a man child. I was bigger than the rest. So. <laughs> <laughs> the boys in my stream, and, <laughs> and I was a bit aggressive. And my best mate gave me that nickname, and it stuck. I, you know, yeah, for so long, and then. Yeah, going back to, uh, yeah, it was 2010, yes, uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, something happened uh, at my house. I just built uh, um, my, my new house. Uh, that, is, that is actually not this one where I'm staying currently, but uh, in Durban. Um, 
and me and my wife, uh, yeah, we, we had just moved in our first night. And uh, yeah, these guys tried to break in. Uh, yeah, and it was pretty crazy. They tried to, to knock the door down. It was just me and my wife in the house. And then I just went ballistic. I don't know what came out of me. Uh, I just rode like an animal and went after them and tried to, to like take them down. And yeah, I literally killed one of them. Almost, almost not killed, almost killed one of oh them. Oh my yeah. God. I was like, you I- so protective. And yeah, so I don't want to go into detail because I don't want <laughs> to take too much detail. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, it's over, it's over 10 years ago. You're all right. Didn't you, didn't you take the car apart or something like that as well? Oh, yeah, trying I did. To drive off. Yeah, I smashed the, the getaway car, the back window, and tried to grab one of the guys. And then I had cuts all over my hand. And, yeah, it was crazy. Like, yeah, my wife was screaming, like, don't, don't run, don't chase after them because they could have been armed, you know? Because I, I wasn't even thinking. I was just like trying to protect my family. And uh, yeah, so yeah, pretty crazy. The boys love me. The, the roar could be heard in the Serengeti, mate, couldn't it? <laughs> as soon as you found that. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit better than uh, Minty's nickname, isn't it? You probably have no idea what Minty's from. <laughs> Please, if, could you explain? I've always wondered. Yeah, when go you... on, Nick. You explain. <laughs> it's what I taste like, mate. It's what I taste like. That's, ah. it. oh, that's, all, you, that's all you need to know. <laughs> so you need to know, mate, we won't keep you much longer, but because yeah. uh, I know actually, um, we just, just had a message actually, me and Brett just had a message from uh, Prince Harry and he's saying that his wife is desperate for you to get back to the US because that's why they fled there actually, <laughs> knowing, that you, knowing that your favourite TV programme is Suits and she's, a, she's your favourite actress, she heard you were going to the States and that's the reason they actually left. Uh-huh. None of this, uh, uh-huh. none of this uh-huh. media trolling, mate, it's none of this media <laughs> trolling. Um, but just... <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, the Rugby World Cup, you know, when South Africa win the Rugby World Cup, it's, it's more than just than any other country winning it, I think, in terms of the impact it can have on the nation, um, in terms of, you know, the influence and inspiration. And this year, you know, clearly with so many players um, from sort of impoverished backgrounds, um, especially, you know, your captain, Sia Khaleesi, you probably had... It, it, you know, I'd imagine and I hope that this World Cup sticks around and enforces change that's needed, uh, not just in rugby, but in society over there as much as possible. Now, clearly with the pandemic, you know, the, the impact of the World Cup was, you know, had not really taken off, I suppose. But uh, if you were to see one major change just in South African rugby and the system in South African rugby in terms of bringing these kids through and, you know, Get get near quality into the system and society. What what would you want it to be, Beastie? Um, I think uh, probably the the changes that are you know I, I want I want to see is, is, is occurring right now. You know, I think I was very fortunate to um, you know to to be a Springbok for such a long time. You know, so I kind of watched the team evolve, and uh, one of the things that we we always lacked in the past was diversity. And I think, as you know, South Africa is a diverse country and and um, we just didn't have that full representation in our test mission. And uh, I remember for a long time, probably for the first six, uh, five, six years of my career, you know, I was, I was the only black guy, you know, starting in the team. And, um, and uh, yeah, so it was just not, not enough, you know, um, you know, our players of color coming through. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, there was a lot of investment that started happening from us. It's a rugby point of view, you know, investing in, in grassroots and just, you know, getting these kids uh, coming through. And uh, and I think you started seeing, obviously, it happen uh, you know, over the last two years. Uh, you know, the likes, you know, you name it. You know, Sia, you know, made his debut, obviously, early on. But you look at, you know, guys like Skungus and Noche, all those guys that are still, you know, probably going to play for the box, you know, uh, a long for a long time to see a long time to come now and um you know i just saw that you know the team evolving and having a lot of guys that you know are, have earned their places uh in in the squad and uh because the the problem was that there was always talk of you know um having a quarter system and you know f- uh, forcing you know um guys into the team which was not fair on guys that deserved you know their their positions in the team that earned it through their performances. But now he started having guys that are actually like were good enough to play for the team. And uh, yeah, so that's why it makes the World Cup so powerful because, you know, you, you had now a team that was probably almost 50-50 uh, 
and everybody in their positions and everybody was you know, playing to the best of their abilities and they deserved their spot. So I think that changed for me. I just wanted, you know, I want to see still there going forward and that it's maintained and they even work hard at it. And then it's not a big elephant in the room, you know, the matter of uh, transformations. And people are not scared to address it because Rossi was like that. He came in and then he was like, guys, we have to achieve a team that's, you know, diverse. And he was like, he went straight to the point. I'm not going to beat around the bush and try and, you know, come so I can lie to you. This is what it is. And and then it became didn't become an issue because everybody knew that, hey, he's working towards this and we buy into it. So, yeah, I guess that's the change I, I kind of, I want to see and uh, probably seen in Devon, you know. Yeah, it's important everyone comes together. Um, one more thing, mate, just just on that. Um, you're a loyal man, loyal to the Sharks, you know, th- throughout your career. Um, you obviously got your business degree, you know, you, you, you were doing a lot of work for this um, security company as well that uh, you've been doing for quite a while in preparation for post-career. Uh, do, do you, at the moment, or do, do you hope to have the opportunity to give back from a rugby point of view? Uh, not not necessarily coaching, but maybe specialised scrummaging coaching or going down and, you know, or in the communities or whatever it might be. You might not have the time now, but uh, do, do you, is that a wish and a desire of yours? Yeah, it is a wish of mine. I, I think uh, I kind of was already playing that role in DC and I was going out and, uh, doing a, a lot of coaching clinics and it, it excited me to, you know, uh, to play that ambassador role for rugby in the States because rugby is so, it's still in, in its infancy, you know, uh, and it's got a lot of growth potential. So for me to kind of be there and grow the game, you know, it was quite a big privilege for me and, uh, and a great opportunity. So for, that's how I kind of see my role now going forward, you know, is, yeah. Just, you know, uh, growing the game globally, working with grassroots. And also, you know, um, if it's the Sharks or the Springboks, you know, just helping on a, on a consultancy basis with the, you know, the set phases, scrums and forwards. And, uh, yeah, as I can't be full-time uh, into coaching uh, because I've seen it stressful. It's not easy. <laughs> so, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> can you spill the beans? Just, just give me one insight. I want to, I want to rip into Nick whenever I can. But can you tell me anything about Nick in South Africa? Just give me one, or just lie. Just make something up about him. <laughs> Be careful, mate. We edit this piece. You can say what you want. We edit it. It's fine. <laughs> No, jeez, no, man, he was great. I got no, I got no dirt on that. Ah. <laughs> no, he's a good lad, he's a good lad. Beastie, mate, well, I can't really think of a better global ambassador for the game than you, let alone South Africa and everything. You, uh, you know, you've had a legendary career. Really, really appreciate your time coming here. I know you're a busy man as well. Um, clearly, I don't think you're done. You don't think you're done. You're hoping that the States get up and running again, but... Uh, Look, what a career you've had, mate. 117 caps, this and that. Lions win World Cup, win Tri-Nations, Rugby Championships, you name it. Um, you're one of the truly great men and you're a great man off the field as well, mate. And uh, I enjoyed my time with you last year. We thoroughly enjoyed talking to you on this. Uh, on yeah, Lucky thank, you. And thank you. And uh, good luck, mate. Uh, look, I'll keep in touch with you anyway, but good luck with um, your new ventures. Cheers. Thank you, my man. Thank you so much for having me, guys. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all the love. Okay. Cheers, Cheers mate. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.